Hello again, as you know, I am Eli the Computer Guy, and today's class is Power Over Ethernet Introduction. So this is a really great, cool, wonderful thing that is revolutionizing the world and making IT guys' lives and girls' lives a whole hell of a lot easier, right? So one of the problems is whenever you want to go out and you want to start installing systems, whether they be computers or telephone systems or surveillance cameras or anything like that, not only do you have to give them network connectivity, but you also have to give them power. So, uh, so you go, you know, you you, you plug in uh, the the network cable for the device, and then you actually have to plug the thing into the wall. Now, when we were dealing with computer devices back in the old, back in the old days in 1999, and all we cared about was client computers and servers, uh, it was pretty easy to power these computerized devices, right? Be the reason it was easy is because you put a desktop computer at somebody's desk, and so everybody knew that you needed to run a power cable to people's desk in order for them to be able to do the work, right? You know, if you have a desk, you run a power cable to the desk, and then you can plug your desktop computer or your laptop computer into that. If you have a server room, uh, same is true. You know, you have power plugs in the server room. You can power all the, you know, plug in the devices. Well, the thing is, as we're going into this new convert, world, right? Where we can have all kinds of weird, different little types of computerized devices. We are now starting to put these devices into areas where people didn't think about putting computer devices before. And so the, the issue with this is that many times there simply is not a power plug uh, available for you to plug the device in. If you want to take a uh, surveillance camera and you want to put it at the top of a building, it's very easy to run a network cable up to the top of the building, easy enough. Uh, but the thing is, is once you get the network cable up there, nobody ever thought that you would be putting a computerized device in that location, so there is no uh, electrical outlet for you to power. The issue then becomes is if you want to actually run a, a normal electric power into all these kind of weird areas, is it's going to cost you a lot of money and it's going to be very difficult. The reason being is you'll have to go out, you have to hire an actual electrician to be able to do the work, Actual electricians cost anywhere between like $150 to $200 per hour. And because they're dealing with real electricity that can actually start a fire or kill somebody, uh, there's a lot of rules and regulations uh, that they have to deal with. So, you know, an you know, electric conduit can only be run in certain ways through certain areas. You can only do this. You can only do that. So the problem is, is you, you think, okay, I want to put a surveillance camera somewhere. You want to put a, uh, a telephone system somewhere. And all of a sudden it goes, from simply taking you know an hour to run a network drop to that location to now you have to call an electrical contractor you, you have to bid out the work for somebody you know to say to figure out who is the best price to get the work done they then have to come in you have to have permits pulled it gets into a real mess so the thought is hey what if we could just power all of these uh, little computerized devices simply through the Ethernet cable so that you don't actually have to have any electric outlets put in. Wouldn't that make life nice? And so that's where we get to power over Ethernet. So with power over Ethernet, what we are doing is we are powering these little computerized devices over the, Ether the, uh, the, the Cat5 network cable. So this has been able to come about for the very important reason that much of the new computer technology that is coming out today it requires very little power in order to run. So back in the day, you know, if you had a desktop computer, you needed 400 watts of power. You're not putting 400 watts of power through this. <laughs> unless you want something really bad to happen. But with these new computer devices, they've been able to make them so power efficient, these little guys can run. I think I think this little guy here runs on like 6.93 watts. So that can very easily run over a Cat5 cable, and you don't have all these problems that you have to deal with in the past. The other thing that's really nice is once you get into something called low voltage, low voltage a lot of times doesn't require the same regulations and the same oversight uh, that high voltage does. So again, if you're going to put in a, a normal power outlet, uh, you have to worry about somebody killing themselves. You have to worry about a fire starting, something like that. When you start dealing with low voltage, what can run over these Cat5 cables, frankly, not a lot can happen. I mean, you can get a little shock. <laughs> right? Uh, but you're not going to burn down the building. Uh, you're not going to kill anybody. I mean, like I say, you can annoy somebody if you start jolting it with 12 volts. <laughs> you 
they may kill you. But <laughs> but that, that's a whole different story, if you get what I'm saying. So being able to run uh, the electricity over these little uh, Cat5 cables means you no longer have to call an electrician, which means, one, you save a lot of money, and you don't have to go through that whole, whole tedious process. And so you can start putting these little devices into all kinds of weird little areas where you wouldn't be able to think about putting them before. And so that's what we're dealing at, with, deal, talking about whenever we're dealing with power over Ethernet, and that is why power over Ethernet is such a great thing. It really, really, really is good. Now, whenever we're talking about power over Ethernet, there are multiple standards of power over Ethernet, like there is for everything out there. Uh, so most power over Ethernet that you're going to be dealing with is something called 802 dot three AF, 802.3 AF. And basically 802.3 AF gives you up to 15.4 watts of power on a single Cat5 cable. So that's how much power can go through this thing. They do also now have 802 uh, dot three AT, which is called Power Over Ethernet Plus, that can then support up to 25.5 watts. Uh, so that is something. So if you need more powerful devices, run over your Ethernet cable. And they are currently playing around with uh, being able to send all the way up to 51 watts over the Cat5 cable. So that's something that's coming down the pike. So uh, with devices that will need more power than these little things, that is what they're trying to do. Now it's important to understand whenever you're going to be installing any kind of this power over Ethernet equipment, exactly what you're dealing with. Are you dealing with equipment that needs PoE Plus, or are you dealing with equipment that just needs 802.3AF? Uh, so if I go over here, this is the, the little Buffalo uh, PoE switch that I've been playing with lately. If I look here, it will actually tell me the standard. So, uh, so it says a... 802.3, yeah, um, yeah, 802.3 AF, and so that's what you're going to be looking for. So on, on the switch or the powering device and the equipment, what you're going to look is to make sure is that they're both 802.3 AF or 802.3. AT, make sure that they actually match. Now, when we start talking about powering the devices, uh, that's where you get into a couple of options. So you're sitting here and you're like, okay, so I've got this power over Ethernet uh, device. How am I actually going to power it? How am I going to get the power over the Ethernet cable so that it works? So this is an important thing to understand. You need to go out and you need to make sure you have networking equipment that will support power over Ethernet. If you're just taking a normal Cisco switch or a normal Linksys switch, it's not going to power this thing. You actually need power. So in order to make that happen, you have to decide on one of two options. So the first option is this little guy here, and this is something called a power over Ethernet injector. So this is for one single port. Don't split it. Don't do anything stupid. It's for one port. So basically, network cable comes in one side, then you plug this into a power adapter, and then the network cable goes out the other side, and that is what provides power. So basically, you know, you have the network cable runs in one side. Uh, then you put another network cable on the other side. This then goes over. You plug this into the device, and that's how it gets power. So this power over Ethernet ejector has an adapter that's plugged into it. That provides power for the line. So if you have like one network camera that needs power over Ethernet, this is what you would do. These little power over Ethernet injectors cost anywhere between... 10 to $50, uh, depending what you're dealing with. Uh, and so that's one of the things uh, that you have to look at. So I know like back when I had my computer shop, I only had two um, IP cameras at the time that could do power over Ethernet. So I didn't need a full switch in order to power lots and lots of different devices. Basically, I just used two power injectors and went from there. Now, if you're going to be using a lot of devices, that's where you go and you get a full-fledged power over Ethernet switch. So this is a Buffalo uh, gigabit power over Ethernet switch and it has four power over Ethernet ports. So you can plug in up to four power over Ethernet devices um, and it will be able to power those devices 802.3.af. So when you're looking at these you can get uh, four ports, you can get 16 ports, you can get 48 ports. Again it all depends on what you're doing. Are you doing a large scale infrastructure uh, or are you doing a small scale infrastructure? Do realize um, that the power isn't transitive between different different switches. So you can't plug in a power over Ethernet port on this to a different switch and then have that switch be able to give power. Uh, that won't work. So when you are designing your infrastructure, do realize that each 
power over ethernet device has to plug in directly into a power over ethernet switch or into a power over ethernet injector. That is a big thing. Now beyond that, there's really not a whole lot to this. So the, the, the communication that happens basically when this little guy uh, gets plugged in here, there's a little communication uh, that goes back and forth and uh, depending on what is said, then the, uh, then the switch will actually give power uh, to the device. There are some things that you have to think about whenever you're going to be powering these power over ethernet devices though, kind of like uh, just, just general things you have to think about for buying advice. Now the first thing that I will tell you for buying advice if you're going to be dealing with power over ethernet is always make sure to buy high quality injectors or high quality switches. Remember, these things are what's going to be sending power to the devices on the other side. So you know, power over ethernet devices, they may be $50 devices, or uh, again, when I had the five megapixel IP camera back when it was new, that was a $2,000 device. So unfortunately, what happens a lot of times is people buy that $2,000 very fancy IP camera, and then they go out and they buy some Chinese piece of crap power over ethernet injector, and then they fry their $2,000 IP camera because for whatever reason, uh, their power over ethernet injector or their power over ethernet switch uh, sent too much power down the line. So just like I've told you, like if you go out and you build your own computer, always make sure you buy a high quality power supply because if the power supply fails, it can fry every component in the system. Same is true when you're dealing with power over ethernet equipment. Now, I'm not gonna tell you whether you should buy Buffalo or, uh, or Netgear or Cisco or any of that. What I'm telling you though is buy name brand equipment. The reason is, is because if there is a surge in one of these devices and that goes out every single port, you can fry not just your switch, but everything that the switch is connected to. Anytime you have a device that is providing power to other devices, always make sure you buy high quality because if you don't, really, 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 really bad things can happen. Now beyond that, one of the things you do have to look at is let's go over to the computer for a minute, is you do have to look and see how much power the, the switch or the power over ethernet uh, injector can give total. So this is the little uh, product specification for this power over ethernet switch from Buffalo. And what you'll see here is it tells you the power. So max 15.4 watts of power for each power over ethernet port, uh, max 40 watts of power total on the switch. Now I want you to do a tiny bit of math here, right? So if each a uh, port on the switch can get 15.4 watts of power and there are four ports. Guess what? That means uh, if you had four 15.4 uh, watt power over ethernet devices connected, it would require 60 watts of power total and this unit cannot provide all that power. So one of the things you're gonna have to do is whenever you go out and you buy any kind of the, the power over ethernet devices, whether they're cameras or whether they're phones or whatever, is you're gonna have to take a look and see how much power each unit requires and then make sure that is not over the maximum. When you add all those together, it's not over the maximum for the particular switch. So I went and I looked at Axis's website and this particular power over ethernet camera, again, like I said, uses like 6.93 watts. So I could have four 6.93 watts onto this particular Buffalo switch, it would be absolutely no problems at all. If for some reason this, these cameras had fancy lights and PTZ and all that kind of stuff, and they required a full 15.4, uh, then this, if I had four of them connected, this would not work. So you may end up having to buy a switch that has more ports than you need simply to provide the power. So again, these are the little things you have to be thinking about whenever you're going to be buying uh, this, this kind of networking equipment. What is the max power total for the switch? Because that can run you into problems. Then of course you go down and you look at all the other stuff and uh, it gives you all the specifications. So that really is all there is. Uh, it's power over ethernet. You know, there's just not a lot to, I mean, from, from the IT standpoint, there's not a lot to it. Uh, make sure you buy good high quality parts, uh, plug them together and voila, it works, right? <laughs> It's, it's great. Uh, you hear a lot of people, I don't know, kind of a little snarky over like power over ethernet and some of these networking things now. And I really don't know what their problems would be. This stuff is just absolutely awesome, especially as IT professionals, because you know what's nice with power over ethernet is again, 
we don't have to call electricians. We don't have to have proposals written up. You know, I, I can have I can have my box of Cat Five cable and run run a new wireless access point or run a camera or any of that, and not need to deal with anything else. Not need to to get approvals or any of that kind of stuff. And that is why this stuff is so good. Now, the warning that I will give you. Warning, right? Is that in a lot of jurisdiction, uh, low voltage wiring uh, is not covered uh, by any kind of uh, laws or regulations, right? So, in a lot of places in the United States, if you want to run low voltage wiring, uh, whether it's you know power over Ethernet or anything like that, basically you can just do it because again, there's not really much harm. You're not really going to burn down a building. Uh, you can't really kill anybody with it. It's just it's, it's, it's low voltage. So most places, uh, you don't need permits or any of that to, to be able to run this. What I will warn you guys, since a lot of you guys are consultants, is in some areas you do. So especially like up in the Northeast, I think in like Massachusetts, uh, low voltage wiring still has to be run by a full-fledged electrician. Again, if it's your business you're running the cable for, um, you know, you're probably not going to report on yourself, but again, if you're a consultant and you're doing work for other people, this is just one of those things to keep in mind that within your area, it, you may be legally required to have an electrician actually run this stuff simply because, you know, electricians got to pay the bills or something like that. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? It's nothing to me, but, but there we go. So if you're going to be doing power over Ethernet, again, 802.3AF gives up to 15.4 watts uh, per per port. 802.AT power over Ethernet plus gives up to 25.5 watts. Theoretically, they're working on 51 watts. We will see what happens there. Um, I have heard a, a lot of talk about the idea that people actually, like uh, the designers in the future, actually want laptop computers and that type of thing to be able to run out over power over Ethernet. And again, what I want you guys to think about with, with where we're going in the future, how does that change the dynamic of everything? If you can power a, a cubicle uh, or where somebody is going to work simply by running a Cat5 cable, that changes how you design buildings. That changes how you interact with the environment. Like So right now, when you're dealing with office spaces, office spaces are designed in very particular ways because since the electrical work is very expensive to do, basically people, they get designed and then those office spaces stay like that until the building is demolished because nobody wants to have to pay for an electrician to come back and rewire everything. Think about going in the future. If we can start powering our laptop computers, if we can start powering all of our devices over Cat5 cable that doesn't require uh, electricians to come in and mess with things, can we start making workspaces more flexible? Instead of creating workspaces uh, that will remain the exact, basically how they are for decades, what if we started creating workspaces that literally can be modified every three months? Now, I mean, you, you don't want to be rerunning network cable every other day. That would be a pain in the ass. But think about that. In the modern world of like startup environments and being able to get groups together and break groups apart, the idea is if you start using computers and such that use power over Ethernet as power, that you can design office environments that will literally only be used for months at a time. So we'll design this office office environment for the marketing department to use it for three months and then when they're done we'll break that down and then we'll redesign the office environment for the IT department to use for a particular project and then we'll break that down. These are the types of things that become uh, possible when you don't have to worry about the, the massive uh, investment of dealing with normal electrical outlets. So something to think about. So this was the power over Ethernet introduction. Again, very, very, very good stuff. Just make sure the warning is always buy the injector or the switch. Make sure you buy good quality. I'm not saying who to buy from. I'm just saying make sure they are good quality. And again, if you're going to be a consultant and you start really doing a lot of power over Ethernet projects, just make sure in your area what the rules and regulations are because, because again, you technically... Uh, you should be able to do this uh, on your own and not have to worry about, you know, regulations. But in some areas of the country, uh, it, you do actually have to hire an elect. You're, you're supposed to hire an electrician to get it done.
nerdswecanfixthat.com. If you're thinking about starting your own computer services company, but you don't want to have to worry about coming up with a logo and copyright and trademark and all of those kinds of things, you may think about buying into a computer services franchise system. Nerds We Can Fix That is a computer services franchise system. They have 62 franchises throughout the United States. They can franchise in every state other than Hawaii. They also franchise internationally. If you're thinking about starting your own computer services company, you should contact them, fill out the information below, or give them a call. Again, as I will say, franchise systems are great for a lot of people, not so good for others. Always make sure to do your due diligence, but if you're thinking about starting a computer services company anyway, you might as well contact Nerds We Can Fix That to see what they have to say. Altero.com, A-L-T-A-R-O.com. If you're dealing with virtualization in a Hyper-V environment, so we're talking about Windows Server 2008 R2, 2012, and 2012 R2, take a look at Altero.com. They have a number of Hyper-V backup solutions. They have the free version, which will back up up to two VMs for free forever. They also have the unlimited version, starting at only $400 per host. I think this is a very good value. So if you are dealing with Hyper-V virtualization and you need a backup solution, take a look at altero.com. Adaccess.com. If you're dealing with Active Directory on a large scale, so you have hundreds of users to add, hundreds of users to disable, so on and so forth, you may want to take a look at adaccess.com. This is Active Directory management and automation software. So this tries to automate and simplify the Active Directory workflow. So if you are in a large scale Active Directory infrastructure, take a look at adaccess.com. Plixer.com. Plixer deals with NetFlow analytics software. So NetFlow is a component of Cisco equipment that shows you what's going on at the network layer, what devices are talking to what other devices, what kind of network jitter, all of that kind of stuff. So Plixer has a free piece of software called Scrutinizer. Scrutinizer is a free NetFlow network traffic analysis tool. So if you want to play around with NetFlow, if you want to see what's going on with the network layer and you have Cisco equipment, take a look at Plixer.com. Click on the link below this video. It'll bring you to this page where you can download Scrutinizer, the free NetFlow network traffic analyst analysis tool. SchoolyMitchell.com. If you're trying to find better internet or telephone service, or if you're trying to find less expensive internet or telephone service, give Schooly Mitchell a call. Basically what these guys are, these guys are telecom consultants. You call them, you say what you need for yourself or your client, and they figure out the best option. They'll examine your existing services and review your bills to make sure there are no errors. Then they'll keep an eye on your services moving forward so that everything remains optimized. Because Schooly Mitchell is objective and independent, they have no ties to vendors. You know they are always your best interests in mind. The best part is there is no fee for their services. The only cost is a portion of the shared savings over a set period of time. If they don't find savings, there is no cost to you. Schooly Mitchell. Is managing users and computers on Active Directory too cumbersome? Download SolarWinds Terrific Trio of free Active Directory admin tools today and start saving time on those Active Directory management tasks. These free tools help you manage and remove computers and users from Active Directory and allow you to add users in bulk. The free tools uh, include inactive user account removal tool enables you to scan Active Directory and optionally remove users who have not logged in for a certain amount of time. Inactive computer account removal tool enables you to scan Active Directory and optionally remove computers that are over a certain number of days old. And user import tool saves time by giving you the ability to create users in bulk using a CSV file. You can even specify the attributes. Also be sure to check out SolarWinds community page thwack.com to connect with more than 100,000 IT professionals. So take a look at solarwinds.com for their free and other tools. Spiceworks.com. These guys have the free network management software, the free mobile device management software, the free community with millions of users. So if you need, if you're an IT professional and you need support, Spiceworks is a great place to go. All of their stuff is basically free and just an absolutely great thing. Again, if you have any questions that I don't answer Answer in the show that are technical in nature. You know, we're talking about Active Directory synchronization between sites in remote areas. Uh, if you click on the link below this video, that will take you to the SpiceWorks community. They have millions of users there that will be able to help you out. So take a look at SpiceWorks.com. Veeam.com, V-E-E-A-M.com. If you just virtualized 100 servers and now you're trying to figure out how to back them up, they have solutions for ESXi, they have solutions for Hyper-V, and as you guys like, they have free stuff. So if you are dealing with a virtualized environment and you're trying to figure out a backup solution, take a look at veeam.com. 
So the hands-on review today is the 5-port Power Over Ethernet Unmanaged Layer 2 Gigabit Switch from Buffalo. So Buffalo sent me a number of pieces of equipment to play around with, and this is one of the pieces of equipment that they sent me that I do have to say I like. So uh, truth be told, I've used Buffalo equipment for a long time, so back when I had my consulting company, I really liked their wireless equipment. I used that a lot, and what I have found over the years is that Buffalo equipment equipment is very good for small scale infrastructure uh, deployments. Again, uh, one of the things uh, whenever you go out and you start uh installing a lot of types of equipment is that you learn to like different vendors for very for pretty specific types of tasks right so i used cisco equipment first for some types of tasks i used the linksys equipment for other types of tasks and what i found with buffalo is i really like this for kind of like infrastructure-ish type tasks so if you're going to be running uh things like digital surveillance systems uh using the power over ethernet um i like it for that if you're going to be doing voice over ip systems i like it for that that if you if you're going to be using like automation systems i like it for that you know with the unmanaged switches you're not going to get a lot of the functionality you will get out of uh, like cisco or that type of equipment but if all you need to do is be able to link equipment together um and just have you know the little box be able to, to service all that equipment for years and years and years uh at a very good uh quality level, that is what I like Buffalo equipment for. So let's go over to the table so I can kind of give you a close up view of this thing. So this is their little five port switch. So now the important thing to understand whenever you're buying any of these types of switches is to make sure you understand what they mean by all of these different ports. So with this five port switch, what you actually have is you, you have four power over ethernet ports. So these are four gig power over ethernet ports with one uplink port. So this port is what you're supposed to use. This would connect either into your router or the uplink port of another switch. So you don't use this normally. Again, that's one of those things you have to be careful about whenever you're buying any kind of networking equipment is how many ports are you actually supposed to be using. With this one, it's technically only four ports and the fifth one is an uplink port. Now what I like about this is it's a nice, good metal construction. So especially if you're gonna be installing this in any kind of business environment, you know, having good old fashioned metal equipment just makes business owners feel a lot better. So if you buy this thing, you can put it in there and they go, oh, look at that. That is a very, very nice piece of equipment. The other thing that I like with this and why I like a lot of Buffalo equipment, again, for that kind of like small scale infrastructure deployment is that this is a fanless design. So uh, you can see it has vent holes on the sides, but there are no fans. So if you're going to be putting this into an industrial type environment, now you don't put this outside, but let's say you're going to be putting this into a warehouse environment and let's say stables, into a gas station, anything like that, since it doesn't have fans uh, for ventilation, you don't have to worry about it getting gunked up too much inside and causing any problems. Now, beyond uh, the power over Ethernet component, that's very nice here. The other thing that I like with this is it actually has loop detection. So there's a little switch here that allows you to turn loop detection on. And what loop detection does is if this detects a loop, it will tell you that there is a loop. So this can be a problem. Um, especially in some small environments where you have a lot of different uh, things going on. So like some environments, you'll have three or four switches all connected to, uh, to different, uh, different rooms. And sometimes you can create a loop without realizing it. So what's nice with this is if it does detect a loop, what it, it'll start blinking and it'll blink red and then it will show you the two ports that are looping. So right now it says port two and three. So that can be very useful. So if you plug something in and all of a sudden the network starts failing, then you know that, oops, um, you know, you have a loop and that you can fix it. That is one of those really nice things. Now, one of the quirks with this that I did not like with this loop uh, detection is that when you switch loop detection either on or off, you have to power off the switch for at least 30 seconds and plug it back in for this to work. So when I was originally playing with this, I had loop detection off. I then flipped the switch and started trying to figure out how loop detection worked and nothing happened. So you actually have to unplug it and plug it back in uh, in order to make that work. So that is one of those little quirks with that. Beyond that, again, you've got gigabit switch 
switches, so that's very nice. And then you've got power over Ethernet. One thing to realize is this will only push out 40 watts maximum for the entire thing. So if you have very, very power hungry uh, power over Ethernet devices that you're plugging in here, there is the possibility they will require more power than this thing can give. But at 40 watts, most things will be able to plug into this just fine. If you have, you know, four rather normal power over Ethernet surveillance cameras, they will be able to plug into this and there will be no issues. Um, so overall, like I say, it seems to be a pretty good thing. The only real quirk I found, like I say, is this loop detection where you do have to unplug it and plug it back in uh, to, to make that work. Now, if we go over to the website, we can just take a look. Again, we can take a look at buffalo.com, just take a look at the, the general stuff. Uh, we get the overview. It tells you all this stuff, you know, gigabit uplink, flow control, metal chassis, the whole nine yards. And if you go, you can also take a look at their PDF and it gives you a lot of information here. Now, again, one of the things I like and why I talk about using this in small scale infrastructure projects, if we scroll down, scroll down, scroll down, we can take a look at the operating environment. Again, one of those things you guys don't think about. And for this, 32 to 113 degrees Fahrenheit. So I really, really, really like that. Again, if you're going to be installing this into a gas station, if you're going to be installing this into a warehouse, it's nice to know that basically as long as you don't freeze this thing or literally boil this thing, uh, it will work fine. If you go in here, you can see some of the other information. You know, it'll... It, it'll uh, it can learn up to 2,048 MAC addresses, which should be more than enough in most little environments, you know, so on and so forth. It tells you all the stuff there. And overall, like I say, I, I would have to say um, I like it. It's a good little box. Um, again, Buffalo did send me this thing. To be honest, FCC compliance, I'm not actually sure if I'm supp supposed to send it back or not. So I might be keeping it or I might be sending it back. But um, I know personally, I have used Buffalo equipment in the past, so I like it. Uh, what I see here is a good thing. Uh, if you buy this from buffalo.com, it costs about $99. If you go to newegg.com, it costs about $90. That's not a bad price for a power over Ethernet switch. And again, it's just one of those things, just good uh, for throwing into, you know, if you're going to be doing surveillance systems, again, in gas stations, you're going to be doing surveillance systems in warehouses, if you're going to be doing little voice over IP systems, any kind of that kind of stuff, I would definitely buy Buffalo. Very good equipment. I think you'll be happy for it. Again, in that, in that un, and that's very important. Whenever you're you're talking about this type of equipment, you know, you got to think about the environment you're you're putting it in. I'm not probably not what I would go for if I was worried about quality of service. Honestly, you know, not what I would go for if I was dealing with large scale infrastructure. If I if if I was dealing with a building that had a thousand uh, client computers. It's probably not what I would go for, uh, but within the small environment where you want to go in, you've got some kind of warehouse, you've got some kind of environment, you just want to go in, you can want to install some kind of network system, and you don't want to have to worry about warranty work for five years, I would definitely say go take a look at the Buffalo Gigabit Power Over Ethernet. Nice, solid box. Definitely, definitely give it a thumbs up. So this question comes from Sean B. Sean B. I don't know S E O N. I don't know how to say that. <laughs> never, never heard that name before. Um, how can I utilize all 24 2.5 inch SAS physical drives on a Dell C6105 using only one of the four available nodes? I feel like I'm back in my MCSE test where I was scratching my head when I saw this question. It was like, why? Excuse the hell out of me. So, so, so just looking at this question. So how can I utilize all 24 2.25 inch SAS physical drives on a Dell C6105 using only one of the four available nodes? So the first thing that, that I notice uh, when we're talking about this is that this is an enterprise class server. So whenever we talk about uh, SAS, a serial attached storage. Basically, this is a version of SCSI, uh, you know, the good old fashioned SCSI, and it is absolutely expensive as hell to run. The only reason you run SAS uh, is uh, if. Um, if, if, if your server really has to be doing something impressive. So you're doing like data center, you're doing web applications, basically you're doing something really big. Then on top of that, you're gonna be running 24 SAS drives. 
that's that's a lot of money simply in storage. I mean, most SAS drives, the minimum, the absolute minimum cost in one of those things is like two hundred dollars. So you know, this is like this is like forty eight hundred dollars in drives alone. So simply by looking at what this guy is saying, this is probably about a ten thousand dollar server. So I was kind of scratching my head on, huh? I wonder what this ten thousand dollar server is. Um, you know, what the what the hell it is, and it's actually a pretty interesting thing. So if we go over to Dell.com, we can take a look at this. And again, I had to take a look to see what the hell we're talking about here. So this is a high density with up to four two socket server nodes, right? So this is a very, very, very specialized type of server. Basically, this is a server that is built for virtualization in the data center uh, world. So when we start talking about server nodes here, what's interesting about this particular type of server is this actually has four servers built into one physical box. So this is four sort of physical servers built into one physical box. So what it is, is you have four servers that essentially share the same power supply, the same uh, the same chassis, the whole nine yards. And the idea is that you, you put these into data centers. So when you do like you cluster virtualization for like high availability and all that kind of stuff, that is where you would use one of these guys. So essentially you have four different servers in there. You can put two uh, CPUs into each of those four servers and if you go and you look at the whole thing it gets pretty cool you know up to 192 gigs of, of memory uh, maximum internal storage is 48 terabytes uh, with that SAS drive so on and so forth and so taking a look at this thing it is a very 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 cool box that is going to cost you a lot of money and so when I took a look at it what I was looking for specifically is that if it said anything about the particular RAID card that it used. So normally when you're dealing with uh, drives, uh, in some kind of server like this, you will have a RAID card that would control those drives. So um, what I was looking for is you have one single uh, 24 uh, controller, 24 port card that deals with all of these drives, or since it's four different nodes, since it's four different technical servers, is each one of those servers uh, restricted to only being able to use six drives? And so these are the types of things that I was looking at, and the answer is at the end of the day, I have no flipping clue. <laughs> At the end of the day, the answer is, ah, I don't know. Uh, and so for Sion, Sean, however you say your name, the best bet, frankly, is just to contact Stell's tech support and see what they have to say. Now, the reason that I'm bringing up uh, this up in, in one of these episodes, uh, answering this in one of these episodes, is because this brings up a very real example of where you have to be careful about the equipment that you're buying, especially in the data center environment. You know, when you're going out and you're buying these large servers. Because a lot of you guys, when you go out and you buy desktop computers, or when you buy laptop computers, basically a desktop is a desktop is a desktop is a desktop. A inexpensive desktop is going to be less powerful than an expensive desktop, but it's still basically the same thing. You can install Windows 8.1 on a cheap desktop. You can install Windows 8.1 on a very expensive desktop, right? You can play video games poorly on an inexpensive desktop. You can run them a lot better on an expensive desktop. Same with laptop computers. Basically, the more you spend for a laptop or a desktop computer, the more powerful it is, uh, the less lag there will be. But it's fundamentally basically the same thing. It's just it's, it's just a nicer thing. You know, it, it's, it plays videos more smoothly, that type of thing. Well, you have to realize, once you start getting into the enterprise world, spending more money for something like a server may fundamentally fundamentally give you something different, right? So a lot of you guys, you know, if you take the desktop mentality and you start going to the server world, uh, when you're dealing with small business or even mid-sized business servers, it's basically still the same thing. You know, uh, you can buy a server with an i7 processor for $2,000. You can buy a server with a Xeon uh, processor for $5,000. Basically, the only difference between those two servers is, is how much load it can take, how much, uh, how many concurrent connections. But what you have to realize is once you start getting over like $5,000 for your server, once you start edging up into $8,000 or $10,000 for these servers, these servers become specialized. So you start getting stuff like this where you spend all this money on a server 
but you're not getting a server. You're getting a box that actually has four servers physically built into it, and then those physical servers can interact with the hardware in whatever way that it's been configured, and that's kind of what you're stuck with. So that's one thing you have to be very, very careful about. Once you start going to the enterprise world, you know, we're used to, uh, you know, just looking at it and going, okay, well, this is a $3,000 server, and I see this $5,000 server here. I have a budget for $5,000. Uh, you know, the boss has already said I can spend $5,000. So I will just spend the $5,000 because it'll make everybody happy. What you have to be careful about with this kind of equipment is you go, okay, well, the boss gave me $10,000. Screw it. I'll just buy the $10,000 server. It'll make everybody happy. And then you buy the $10,000 server, and then you've got these nodes, and you've got this thing going on, the other thing going on, and it's not like you're like, wait a minute, that's not what I bought. So there you go. And again, what I'll say with a lot of these kind of sp more specialized things is really all you have to do is call like Dell's customer support and see what they have to say. What you have to be careful about when you're buying this, this higher end equipment though is a lot of this stuff can't be jury rigged. Again, one of the things you guys get really used to uh, is in the low cost world when you're spending $2,000 for a server. Uh, you know, you buy a server and it has certain specifications, and then you can kind of jury rig it. You know, you can use a little duct, duct tape and bubble gum to make it do whatever it is you want to do. One thing you do have to realize once you start going up to these more expensive servers, it gets much more complicated to try to jury rig those things. Basically, these systems are built to do something very specific. Uh, and if you're trying to get them to do something else, a lot of times it simply won't work. So be, again, once you start getting up uh, to the price point of something like this, be very careful. And again, uh, one of the things that I tell you guys is whenever you're going to be buying expensive equipment, whenever you're going to be buying Cisco equipment, or like say these high-end servers, you really need to contact the sales department uh, from the vendors and ask them what uh, what you need. Again, one thing you guys don't think about, because you got, you got, a lot of you guys are so used to dealing with Best Buy and these companies where the salespeople are just, frankly, kind of idiots. They don't know what they're talking about. Is What you have to understand is when companies are selling you five or ten or twenty thousand dollar pieces of equipment their salespeople are generally much better so what you do is you call them up you say this uh, these are my set of circumstances this is what I need what can you sell me and then they'll make they'll try to make sure that you buy the best thing uh, for for what you need one of the problems that I see happens time and time and time again is everybody is worried that somehow the salespeople will try to screw them over so then they decide I'm not going to use a salesperson I'm just gonna buy whatever the hell it is I think I should buy and then they buy their own thing right so long story short with this guy go contact contact your salesperson from Dell and ask them see if they can give you some tech support on this thing uh, and in the future call uh, <laughs> call the salesperson before you buy it you'll be happier at the end of the day so this question comes from Ratchet K I want to go for a professional certification of the cloud. Can you help in deciding which one uh, be the best as there are many certifications in the market? About, about my background, I'm a telecom professional with six years of experience with totally non-cloud background. <clears throat> so you worry me. <laughs> oh dear, Ratchet, you so worry me. Um, um, uh, what do you mean certification in the cloud? Come on, man! You got six years' experience. You should, you should know the answer to this question. So, so the big problem that keeps coming up. Everybody keeps talking about the cloud. I want a certification for the cloud, and then people like me are scratching their heads, like I, that doesn't even mean anything. It really, really, really doesn't mean anything. So remember, whenever we're talking about cloud technologies, basically what we're talking about with cloud technologies is that you cannot put your finger on which piece of hardware a particular service is running on at any one point in time. Basically, it is in the cloud. So you have a rack of servers, and you know somewhere in that rack of servers your little web application is running, or the instance of your virtual server is running, but you can't say, I know on server two it is running there, right? So back in the old days, you know, all of our servers and web applications, we knew exactly where they were. You walked into the data center, I knew that server two 
ran Windows 2008. That Windows 2008 had the Active Directory server on it. I knew exactly uh, where the operating system and where the service and all that was, right? Then we go to the cloud, and what happens with virtualization is now we can move instances of operating systems uh, around within this cluster of servers so that at any one point in time, we don't know exactly where the Active Directory server is. Maybe, maybe currently it's on server one, or maybe it's on server 10, you don't know. It's all, it's all kind of getting migrated around uh, in those servers based on whatever management uh, uh, software you have running, right? And when we talk about cloud on the, on the internet, basically we're talking about the same concept, only you're accessing uh, those services through the internet. So you're going up you know, onto the cloud. So what you have to realize, whenever you start talking about, I want to be certified in the cloud, that doesn't mean anything. It really doesn't mean anything. Uh, it, what, really what it comes down to is what technologies do you want to be certified in? So if you want to deal with Microsoft uh, virtualization, right, then you would want to go for an MCSE and get a uh, certified uh, MCSE uh, has a number of different tracks and one of those tracks is the Hyper-V track, so virtualization within that. Uh, if you like VMware, VMware has a number of different certifications. You can go on that track. Uh, if, if you want to do something super sexy, you want, do, you want to do something man cutting edge that will be good for a couple years to come uh, start learning docker so docker is absolutely awesome it's a technology to create something called Linux containers mind-blowing mind-blowing like basically Linux containers are kind of sort of like virtual instances kind of sort of I did a class on them before it gets a little complicated but basically you can create these Linux containers in order to do a specific task and then you can drop them uh, when that task is completed so basically if, if you are running some kind of like uh, any kind of query or if, if you're running some kind of process and you want to run that process in an absolutely clean environment you can pop up a container do that process in that absolutely clean container and then drop the container like literally in a heartbeat. Um, I was I was talking to somebody where they were talking about I don't know what it was. It was able they were able to 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 spin up and drop like two hundred containers per minute. Uh, you know, somebody was talking about I think uh, I think uh, Google last year used like two billion containers like just just absolutely insane they have all these different processes going on and so that is a cloud technology Hadoop Hadoop uh, is dealing with a uh, data storage within the cloud all that kind of stuff but that's what you have to understand I mean these are these are computer technologies these are uh, computer pieces of software uh, that are within the cloud technology world, but you know, again, what is it you want you want to do? Do you want to do uh, VMware? VMware is cool. I like VMware. Then you will get a VMware certification. Do you want to do Microsoft Hyper V? Hyper V is cool. Active Directory is still cool. Uh, then you would do an MCSE, a Microsoft uh, Certified. Uh, uh, whatever uh, that uh, if you want to do again if you want to do docker uh, I don't even think there is any certification on docker uh, Linux containers then you would learn that if you want to learn Hadoop again I'm not sure if there's any certification on Hadoop you would learn Hadoop so basically what you have to do is you have to go out and you have to figure out what technology it is that you actually care about and then go on the path to become certified or professional and that again when you say cloud, I want to work in the cloud. I want to be certified in the cloud, Eli. It's just like a noob saying, I want to work on computers. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like, like when a noob comes in and they do their very first interview and the interviewer looks over and goes, what do you want to do in technology? And then the noob says, computers, right? <laughs> That's basically what you're saying. We say the cloud. What does the cloud mean? It could be VMware. It could be Linux containers. It could be this. It could be that. It could be the other thing. There, there's no, you know what I'm saying? So figure out what it is you want to do with the cloud and go from there. And stop talking about the cloud. Again, everybody who says, I want to work in the cloud. I want to be certified in the cloud. It's just like that little noob saying, I want to work on a computer. It doesn't mean anything. So go out there, take a look. Um, honestly, there's no certification. I, I don't believe there's a certification for it. There may be a certification for it. What I would take a look at is becoming a professional, and it's, they're called Linux containers. Um, the, the technology or vendor or whatever, it's called Docker, uh, D-O-C-K-E-R. That is what I, that is super sexy, super cool, cutting edge, 
changes just everything about everything within the IT world. So that's what I would look at. But again, I don't believe there's any certification for it. Oh, so the final thoughts for today, the final thoughts for today. Oh, the final thoughts for today can come from the only place that would actually present this, and that is reality. So I just want to talk to you guys for a moment about all of the hate that I'm receiving because of these stupid ass giveaways, right? So a while ago, actually a little while ago, right? About four months ago, I started doing giveaways. So, uh, so all of these vendors just send me a, a, a ton of, of items and stuff and all that stuff was piling up. So I decided, hey, I'll start doing giveaways of these items. Basically pack three or four of items into a box, throw in a little swag and do a little contest or whatever to give this stuff away. I'm really not doing it for advertising purposes. It really is kind of one of those things where I just have a lot of stuff. My wife is giving me the evil eye because it's all piling up. And I said, hey, wouldn't it be kind of nice just to be able to give this stuff away to, to all of you guys? Just figure out a way and give it out. And most of the boxes that go out, the, the price price tag on most of these boxes is anywhere between like 150 all the way up to about $300. So it's pretty good. I'm paying the shipping and aid and no, no worries. All right. I figured this would be a great thing. But holy hell, I am getting a lot of hate over this. And I just want to talk to you guys uh, about this for a minute because this is why people stop doing nice things, right? You know, it's one of the one of the reasons I, I try to talk to you guys so much in the real world is because there are so many things that happen in the real world. And because there's no real conversation, there's no real communication, nobody really understands what's, what's going on. And one of the things that happens in the real world is once most people reach a certain socioeconomic level, they stop dealing with the lower socioeconomic levels. It's one of those kind of things, all right? You know, and everybody goes, oh, you know, you think you're too good for the rest of us or any of that. And what you find out as you move up the socioeconomic spectrum is that, frankly, at a certain point, what you find is that people are a really massive pain in the ass uh, and you just get tired of dealing with it. You know, you get tired of trying to do nice things for people and continually getting kicked in the nuts for it. So like, like I say, you know, doing these giveaways, uh, I, I just decided to do them. I don't really collect your information or any of that. It's like, okay, I'll, I'll just send this items out. But one of the issues with sending these items out is that uh, I only do it in the United States. And the reason I only do it in the United States is because if I ship things within the U.S., uh, it's a very reasonable shipping cost. Basically, it's like $13 to ship a box. Um, and I don't have to deal with customs. I mean, customs isn't a joke, right? So if I if I send anything uh, internationally, you have to fill out this whole form, uh, you know, write down every single thing that, that that's in the box. You have to declare the value of it. There, there's just a whole mess. So basically, if I ship things in the United States, uh, it costs me thirteen dollars. I fill out no paperwork. If I try to ship things internationally, uh, again, I have to fill out all the customs paperwork. And not only that, but it costs a lot of money. You know, instead of being thirteen dollars, it's anywhere between you know fifty to $150 basically for the exact same package. And so what I decided is, you know, hey, what? I will just make this for U.S. residents. U.S. Re you know, the United States is big enough. The people in foreign countries, you know, uh, oh well. You know, again, I don't, I don't, I don't care when I ship this stuff. I don't, I don't care if you're, if you're Mexican. I don't even care, you know, if, if you're an illegal immigrant in the United States. All I care about is you have that U.S. shipping address. But oh my golly, I have been getting so much hate over this. And I just want you guys to realize, you know, whenever you're dealing with people in the real world, that it really does get depressing at a certain point. You know what I'm saying? And you wonder why people stop doing nice things. And you wonder why those, those people that have the ability to do good things for the world kind of sequester themselves and kind of go into their caves and kind of stop dealing with people. And let me tell you, one of the reasons is, is just because what complete bastards uh, so much of the world's population can be. Instead of, like I say, I'm doing this giveaway, instead of saying, oh, I'm sorry, I wish that, uh, I, I wish that I wish that I'm in the UK. I, I, I wish I, I could get the items. You know, instead of just being, you know, being a little sad about it, all the snarkiness, all the meanness. I got, I got this one thing today where this guy is like, "Well, I'm not gonna say anything rude, but I'm gonna unsubscribe from you." And you're like, "Wow!" So I'm, I'm giving stuff away. I'm paying my own money to ship these items to some random person in the United States, and because I'm not shipping internationally, you're going to unsubscribe from me. Um, I have some very, very, very impolite words 
<laughs> to say on that note. So it's just one of those things, like I say, just something to think about when you're dealing with stuff in the real world that no matter how nice you try to be, people can just be tedious, snarky, little nasty pieces of crap. Um, and you just, you just have to be ready for it. Again, like I say, you know, when I, when I did the, uh, the, the consulting business and I do dealt with a lot of people uh, in the city, that was one of the amazing things that I found is some of the people that I treated the nicest ended up treating me like the worst. You know, you go in there and you're nice to somebody and you give them a discount. So you go in and you do some work and you're like, oh, okay, I see you don't have enough money. I'll only bill you for two hours instead of three, right? So you're trying to be nice. You're trying to be nice. You're trying to reduce their bill, you know, so everything's good. And then what happens is they come back like a year and a half later and they go, hey, remember when you fixed my computer a year and a half ago? And remember when you took so much money off that bill? Yeah, I remember that. Well, it's broken again and I expect you to fix it for free. You're like, oh, I hate you people. <laughs> I hate you people with a passion. So again, just something to think about. The two things to think about. One is if you get to a position where you can start doing nice things for people, realize that people are going to start treating you like a piece of crap for whatever reason, or a portion of the world is going to treat you like a piece of crap. And the other thing to think about is if you're on the other side, and this is one of the, the, the things that I keep talking about, like I say, with difference in socioeconomics and all that, and, and why people stop dealing with poor people is one of the things you have to realize is that when you act aggressive towards anybody who is trying to do good things, who is honestly trying to do good things, there's no scam behind it or whatever, what ends up happening is they end up shutting down. I know so many people that have tried to do good things in the world and then they have gotten smacked so hard for legitimately just simply trying to do good things that they simply shut down and they stop giving money and they stop doing things and they stop being nice because it's just so tedious and hard. And that's one thing like a lot of people people don't understand. It's like in their little worlds, everything is so aggressive and everything is so in your face that they present that to people that are trying to do good things. And then what happens is then those people that are trying to do good things just kind of put up their hands and go like, screw it. I'm done. I can't deal with this anymore. I've been successful. I'm trying to give things to the rest of the world and the rest of the world is acting really crappy to me. So screw it. I'm just going to go to South Beach. <laughs> You know, you know what I'm saying? It's like, I can either take this money and make the world a better place and be treated like a piece of crap by a lot of people, or I can take the same amount of money and go to South Beach and everybody will be nice to me. Hmm, maybe I'll just go to South Beach again. One of those random final thoughts for you guys to think about, but oh my golly, I have to tell you guys, I think that I'm getting so much hate over these stupid giveaways. Oh, I know. I know a lot of you guys love the giveaways, and I know a lot of you guys are nice, but you would be you would be shocked at how much hate I'm giving getting over these stupid giveaways. And it's just like, oh my golly, you're damned, you're damned no matter what you do in life. So our little Patreon campaign to create a better world for geeks is still trucking along. We're up to that $129 with 31 patrons. So you guys know I did go and I met with uh, a the, the head of a of an organization called Future Makers last week, and they basically provide technical uh, training to kids who go to you know public uh, schools and all that kind of stuff. So I met with them to try to figure out better ways to to help fund some of these projects. And tomorrow night, I'm going to be going to a meeting with, I don't know, something like 20 of uh, the different big wigs in the area, all discussing, you know, how to how to develop projects uh, in order to educate the, the local kids about technology and how to make a world a better place and all that kind of stuff. So, um, just so you guys know, I am still out there. I am trying to figure out how to give away money uh, to make the world a geekier place. So, if you want to contribute anything to the Patreon campaign, again, all the money that goes to the Patreon campaign. Basically, it comes in and then it goes out. And in case you have any any uh, questions about whether or not I'm actually going to spend any of the money, again, I've, on November 10th, I already donated uh, $5,000 to a program called Code in the Schools. So it really will go to a good thing. So if you're interested, take a look at our Patreon campaign, patreon.com forward slash Eli the Computer Guy. And uh, I'll keep you guys up to date as we find new cool things to fund.